good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the introduction there, John. Uh, yes, uh, my name's Paul and I work for Mozilla on the Firefox OS project. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Firefox OS, uh, we've taken the task of trying to build a phone where all of the UI on the phone is HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So uh, every single thing that you see is actually just a web page, um, which I think is really awesome and was kind of what led me to get involved in the first place. Um, because it makes client-side security really, really interesting, um, which is something that maybe wasn't, wasn't so complicated in the past, and that's really what I want to talk about today, is the direction um, of where client-side security is going, or some of the things you need to think about, um, and, and what some of the challenges are. So before I joined Mozilla, I used to be a uh, security consultant, which meant doing a whole lot of different things, but one of those things was doing uh, website security testing. Um, and it was always just a little bit disappointing when we uh, were asked to test a website and we see the .html at the end of the URL. Because usually that meant that you know, they weren't, there wasn't going to be anything particularly much happening on, uh, on that website. It was very unlikely we were going to have security issues. Um, but this is, certainly isn't the case today. Um, and becoming, as HTML becomes used in all sorts of different areas, like on Firefox OS, so the, the interface for phones, devices, televisions, whatever, um, we're seeing that client-side is becoming much, much more complex, um, which is great for security problems. Um, not so great if you're actually trying to secure that sort of a platform. Um, so we have uh, interfaces that are becoming more complex. Um, they're also doing more things, and they have much greater powers. Uh, on Firefox OS, one of the key goals is to give access to the same level of APIs that native apps have access to. So that means granting access to all these powerful and potentially dangerous APIs um, to, to essentially the web. Um, so the impact of security problems on the client side is also uh, more severe. So we have a situation where it's, more, it's increasingly likely we're going to have security problems and the impact of those. So ultimately the risk is higher. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that, and I'm going to keep saying this all today, it's, it's serious business. We need to start taking client-side security seriously. I promise that's the only animated GIF in my slides, but I just couldn't help myself. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? So first of all, um, a lot of you might be familiar with uh, client-side attacks, but I'm just going to sort of revisit the basics and sort of strip it down to first principles um, and, and make sure that everyone's sort of on the same page. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, or what, I guess the common defense strategies that I see people using. Um, disclaimer, I'm, I'm a security guy. I, my role is mainly doing testing and things like that, so I'm going to give you some suggestions about what I see people doing and, and the issues that I have, have, but um, ultimately uh, there, there's a lot of different ways you can do things securely. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about frameworks and the directions that I see, well, I think I see um, people going in and the security consequences of that, and then also touch on a technology called content security policy, uh, which I think a lot of people have been speaking to, they're like, yeah, I, I've heard of content security policy, but can, can I get a, is, does anyone actually use content security policy on any of their websites? A few hands, one, maybe? Okay, so it, it's not a widely adopted technology yet, but um, it's something that's very important um, because this is sort of a direction, especially on the client side, and it has a, a very good usage on the client side, which I'll explain later. Okay. Um, so, who's heard of DOM-based XSS? A few, one or two. Okay, so cross, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of cross-site scripting, but what I'm going to focus on today is a particular type of cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting is usually where you have some kind of attack that maybe is sent to the server, it then gets reflected back to the client, and then causes an issue on the client side. But when everything is on the client side, you can still have this issue. Um, and this is an example of, of, of DOM-based XSS. Um, so what we have here is if someone sets the uh, URL to something like this, um, we're going to have whatever is after the hash be passed straight into es essentially a DOM. We get the string inserted into the DOM, and then you can do things like grab cookies and do whatever else. Um, so let's have a look at why, like, so everyone's sort of familiar with XSS and you steal cookies and blah, blah, blah. But fundamentally, what's, what's going on here? Um, so let, 
I want to take a, a, a data flow analysis approach, and this is something that in, in, when we're looking at reviewing apps or when I'm trying to review an app to see is it secure, um, this is sort of the first ap approach I'm taking is uh, what are the sources of input um, that, uh, that a web application has? So we want to look at the sources of all the untrusted data. And then we want to find out where is this data going? And we call the uh, sinks is typically the, the, um, the word that we use. So in this previous example, we have source, which is a document.location.hash. So that particular uh, attribute is an untrusted source of input. Um, and then we have our sync, which is in a HTML. And when you have untrusted source hitting a sync, that's when you get problems. So what type of sources do we have in a client-side app? Um, we have location. L location's probably the most commonly seen one, um, and there's a bunch of scanners out there that will focus specifically on identifying uh, this like, specific example that I just showed, where you have a location input and then it gets injected into the DOM. Um, but there's other types. So cookies. Um, can you trust your cookies? Well, maybe you can, but what about if you're on a domain that's maybe you have a parent domain cookie scoped on your site, and then maybe you use that data. Um, so there's potential that you might have, um, that parent domain might be used on another site, which also shares that parent domain, and you end up with data that you, don't, you weren't expecting, or it's not in the format that you're expecting, or maybe it's not escaped. So it's potentially untrusted. Um, there's things like refer and the window name, which can all be set by other websites, which you have to be careful about. Um, and then there's also indirect sources. So that's things like, um, when you, you see a lot of, actually one of the earlier talks, they're so talking about something like PouchDB, uh, where you have a client-side database. You're putting a whole bunch of data into a database, and then at a later time, you're pulling it out. Now, maybe you make some assumptions about, oh, maybe that data will be escaped on the way in. But maybe for some reason or another, you end up with um, uh, unescaped data or some other kind of dangerous data that you're pulling out of the database. So, and then you just think it's trusted because you're pulling it out of your database. Um, and then finally, there's a, like things. Uh, there's lots of other objects um, in the web. There's things like post message. So if you get a message event, you have uh, that. That's coming from another window potentially. And um, everyone probably should know about. You know, you need to always need to check the origin of message events so you know you can sort of validate where it comes from. But on a mobile device, and, and increasingly, we're seeing new APIs and new ways of talking in between apps. Um, like, for example, on Firefox OS, there's this thing called Web Activities, which allows apps to sort of launch each other and talk to each other. And that's, that, that's another source of untrusted data. What about syncs? Um, so there's lots of different types of syncs. So there are um, the example that I showed you before, that's a HTML element sync. It's when the data gets taken in, you can create a HTML element from that. But um, I'm going to go through a few different types, but there's a good reference that I'd refer you all to. Um, is, it's called the DOM XSS Wiki, and it has a description of all lots of different types of syncs. Um, and it's, it's a good enumeration of the types of problems that you can see uh, on client side, um, because you'll see as I go through these, basically every different type of sync has a different consequence. So the most basic one, or the, I guess probably the most dangerous one, um, is, is something like everyone sort of the danger of eval. You know, you take a string, it, you eval it, obviously that's dangerous. Um, but there's, there's quite a number of different execution syncs in the browser. Um, any of these things, if you pass uh, untrusted data to it, will result in arbitrary script execution in the, concept, the context of your app. So you're basically giving control of your app away, which is obviously not what you want. Um, most commonly, the ones I see in app reviews, I, eval and function, especially when you're using frameworks, that can sometimes be an issue, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But um, the most ones, like uh, click handlers, is, is certainly the place where people don't, and a click handlers look, because they're in the HTML, people don't really think about the fact that that's a little script tag sitting there, just waiting for um, the attacker to come along and abuse it. Um, yeah. HTML element syncs. Um, so this is the, the previous example. And uh, I was going to say I don't want to harp on about it, but I am going to harp on about it, because if you take nothing away from this uh, talk but 
just the awareness of how dangerous inner HTML is. Actually, I've, I've noticed in quite a few of the slides already, there's been lots of examples of people using inner HTML, and it, it's safe as long as you use a, a, a static string and you know you're trusted where, where that input comes from, but it's very dangerous. And um, so minimize the use of, of inner HTML where you can. Um, but there's, be aware also that there's lots of other places that are HTML element syncs. And of course, if you can create HTML elements, you can create script tags, and then you can have complete control. Um, location. So location's an interesting one because it's a source, but it's also a sync. If you are able to set the location of a, uh, like a window location or something like that, not only can, well, you can, first of all, you can script it like JavaScript, blah, 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 and, and you have script execution. And often we'll see websites that specifically you know, they'll, they'll make sure that the first start of a string doesn't contain that, but it's more than that. Um, for a client-side app, where you're located is, is basically your control, and if you allow someone else to navigate you, you allow, you lose control and they end up somewhere else. And that, depending on the context, that can, that can have um, consequences. And then, this is, yeah, an interesting one, I guess. It might seem a bit contrived, but, if you, if you allow people to inject or take control of a uh, variable that's then used inside in this manner, you're basically again giving them um, control of your app. Now, it, it might seem like a bit of a contriving, like why would you ever do something like this? But, uh, so this bug here is actually, um, this is some code from Firefox um, for Gecko uh, in, a, in the downloads API, something that uh, I noticed a little while back. Um, basically, what's happening here is we have a, uh, a message. Uh, Firefox OS has a multi-process model where there's messages between apps and child and parents apps. It's a bit out of the scope to talk about here, but essentially, I'm getting a message which is, is potentially untrusted, and the message will say something like downloads get list. Um, what this function does is it takes the downloads get list, it then splits it out, gets the get list bit, and then calls the function called get list. So what's the, the obvious problem there? If you, if you don't control that message that's coming in, that can be absolutely anything. It could be eval, for example. And because you also control the argument here, it's basically arbitrary script execution. Um, so in this case, it, it, this is only a one of a number of controls, so it's not too serious. But if this was in a web application, this would be a, um, a, a particularly serious issue. Okay, so that's, that's just a, a bit of context about what the problems are. Um, let, let's look at how do, you, how do people generally protect against these sorts of things. So the most basic way, um, and if you do nothing else, do this, is first of all, you want to completely avoid converting strings to JavaScript. Um, there's very little, like there's, there's not really many use cases when you actually need to do this in production code. Um, a lot of frameworks do it because it, it makes, uh, it, it, it's just the way they work and, and it's, it's convenient and stuff like that. And there are some particular cases where you, you need to do this, but it, by and large, it's, it's pretty rare. Especially um, the main problem that I see when reviewing apps is like the set timeout one where people are just using strings um, as functions instead of just passing a function handler. Um, so, so try and avoid that. Um, use in, in a HTML only when you absolutely have to use in a HTML. Text content is supported in like just about everywhere. Um, it's not supported in IE8, but there's lots of, like if you just do a search for a polyfill, you'll find a nice polyfill that will um, give you inner text instead. Um, and that will never cause XSS. So uh, make it easy on your security reviewer or your security team if you have that sort of thing, or make it easier on the developer who's doing the review of your code. Minimize the number of uh, places where you use in a HTML, and I guarantee you will reduce the number of security issues. Um, some alternatives, obviously, use text content. You can create nodes by, uh, you know, using document.create element and set attribute. That's, you know, guaranteed to be safe, unless you do something silly like create a script element and then set that directly. But at least then you have, you're doing it um, explicitly, so you're quite aware of the context of that, and you know, you know that it's kind of dangerous. So. Um, I, I'm going to tell you to do this, and then you're probably going to go away, and you're going to continue to use inner HTML because it's easy and whatever, but be aware of the security consequences. So what's the next sort of 
approach that people take, and, and, and this is probably a step up from just you know, assigning things to inner HTML strings, is, is using some kind of templating approach. And there's lots of different uh, libraries and uh, uh, frameworks and stuff out there that will, will do this for you. Um, typically, the way they work is things like you'll have some kind of placeholder for data. Uh, they'll escape characters for you. Um, and then they'll uh, eventually insert them into the DOM, i.e. they'll set it to something like inner HTML, which is great um, for the most part. When you use some kind of templating language, you need to be very careful about uh, what kind of escaping is actually going on. Um, so in, in this example, um, and this could be uh, like something like Handlebars does automatic esca escaping. So it will escape um, HTML content for you. So, and it will also escape uh, quotes. So if you, in, like the first two examples there, if you, no matter what you put into there, you'll never have an issue with breaking out of the context and, and causing a security issue. However, if you use that same pattern and you inject data into a uh, href tag, you're now setting a location sync and the escaping that's automatically applied won't protect you. So that's something that you really need to be aware of um, because that, that's one of the most common issues that I see is uh, the templating language will do the automatic escaping for you, but they won't do the automatic checking of what context are you actually injecting to. That's left up to the developers. Um, so I would employ you, uh, if possible, try to use some kind of either code review technique or even, even better would be to try and use some sort of automatic technique which flags issues like this and prevents you from doing this, maybe at uh, build time or, or whatever, um, but uh, ideally dynamically. What about HTML input? Because that's, I guess, where a lot of this, the falling down comes. Um, you know, you often need to, uh, maybe you need to do posts or you need to accept some kind of user data and, and it needs to have some kind of formatting. Um, so the, the typical temptation here is to, um, you know, you, well, you want to take that input and you want to sanitize it somehow. Um, the best recommendation I can probably give you is try not to write your own sanitizer. Um, and unless you're very, very sure of what you're doing, uh, or maybe you have a very, very small subset of input that you're sure is going to be safe, um, it's most of the time better not to use your own sanitizer. Um, but if you are going to build your own sanitizer, when you ignore my advice, um, the, the common failure that I see is people taking just a bunch of regular expressions uh, and filter out, maybe they filter out less than and, and hope, hope for the best. Um, what the, the steps that you're really taking are parse the input to what you think the DOM representation is, go through that DOM input, and then keep the list of nodes that you think are safe. Rather than trying to strip out the bad stuff, keep the things that you think are safe, and then um, put that into the DOM. The reason why this is a better approach, and you may have a situation where it fails and you miss a, a, um, a you know, some kind of input that's weird or something like that, um, it will fail securely rather than fail insecurely. Um, and in terms of doing the parsing, um, you can use the browser to actually do the parsing for you rather than trying to parse it with some complex regular expression. If you do, in Firefox, if you do document.implementation.create element, uh, sorry, .create document um, with just a, an empty string, that'll give you a document that's created as data, and then you can use inner HTML as to your heart's content, and it's completely safe because it's not attached to a window, so there's no script execution, there's no URL prefix, um, prefetching or anything like that. Um, so then you can muck around with it, you can traverse the tree, discard nodes to your heart's content, and that's actually the um, approach that a number of these sanitizers that I would recommend that you use actually take. So that's Dom Purify does this, for example. Um, Angular has a sanitize function, which is uh, that it's pretty decent from what I've heard. Um, if you have a situation where you need to do sanitization in a worker, um, you can look at Bleach.js. That's actually what we use in Firefox OS. There's a worker-friendly fork. The, the problem with the approach that I talked about earlier using the document, document's obviously not available in a worker. So you can use um, Bleach uh, for those cases. And there's lots of others, but th these are the ones that I'm familiar with anyway. Um, okay, so the basics of, of trying to avoid uh, ending up with script injection or HTML injection in your, um, in your client-side web applications, 
just don't use eval and try and minimize the use of inner HTML where you can. You'll make it much easier to secure your application if you only use dangerous functions when you absolutely need them. Um, if you're using a template language, be very careful with how you use attributes um, and, and be careful where you, in, you actually inject the data. Uh, in terms of if you are, do have to in, accept HTML input, um, filter very conservatively. Uh, be careful about the types of data you accept as well. So uh, things like SVG and MathML, they're a lot harder to parse. So just be wary if, you're gonna, if you want to accept user-generated uh, SVG and things like that. Be, be aware of the, uh, the dangers that those things uh, involve. OK, but so that's, that this is all well and good if you're just writing pure native HTML, no, no, nothing on top. But what about if you're actually using frameworks? Um, and I imagine for most of the apps that I see actually in involve frameworks of one, one sort of another. So let's have a little bit about um, how frameworks impact on security. Um, I'm, only, I'm going to be able to brief, talk briefly on this topic, but I would encourage you again that the DOM XSS wiki is a really good um, resource for this. Um, there's also the Mustache Security Wiki, uh, curated by a guy called a guy by the name of Mario uh, Heydrich. I don't know how to pronounce that, but um, and I yeah strongly recommend that you go and have a look at uh, that wiki. It has a lot of good information about um, MVC frameworks for JavaScript. And there's a couple talks actually you can look. Some of this stuff, the next section is is basically from from these two talks, um, and it's it's very interesting about some of the impacts around. What, what frameworks or what impact frameworks have on security. I'm going to talk about three. These are kind of selected at random just because I thought they were interesting um, and, and because of the impact they have. So first of all, um, jQuery. So jQuery actually is a sync, or at least it used to be. Um, if you did that, does anyone have any idea what that used to do? That would basically execute script. Um, up until bug 9521, um, you could just put script straight into there and bam, you would have, you'd have cross-site scripting. Um, that's since been changed and that's no longer the case. However, in jQuery migrate 1.9.1, the same thing was reintroduced. So if you're using these things and you're using old versions, you need to be aware that that's, um, that, that's an issue, that's a potential issue. But a bigger issue with jQuery, I think anyway, is jQuery adds all these awesome functions which are really usable and they're really useful, but they're all HTML element syncs. So if you pass user data to any one of these functions, you're potentially having the same issue as inner HTML. So they're, they're basically taking inner HTML and propagating it out. So for your poor security guy, when he has to come through or she has to come through and review this code, then all of these things are potential sinks that they have to look at and try and figure out, okay, what's the path the data's taking through the application and is it actually secure? It's a lot more difficult to verify if this is, if this is going to be um, safe or not. So I guess you just need to, to keep that in mind when you're writing an application that to, to be uh, careful about the way you approach taking user data to try and minimize the, the chance that you're going to end up with the sources ending up at these sinks. Um, Knockout JS is a MVC framework that I don't really know much about, um, other than this example, which I can uh, talk about. But the interesting thing that I wanted to point out here is, so security people do a lot of um, you know, learning about what are, what are the different types of attacks, and there's all these obscure um, attacks like style elements contain script. If, if you can inject into a style element, sometimes you can break out of that and you can cause script and all this sort of stuff. So it's very complicated. But that's just if we look at just the HTML spec. When we have frameworks like this that then add new attributes into the HTML syntax, we increase complexity that um, security scanners, maybe security people weren't, weren't potentially thinking about. So if you're relying on other things like maybe browser security controls or things like that to protect you, they're not, they're not going to take these sort of things into account. Um, and in Knockout, if you can inject into a data bind variable, basically you can, you have script injection, or, uh, or HTML injection too. Um, uh, Angular, uh, how many people use Angular here? 
Quite a few. Um, yeah, I, I love Angular, actually. I think it's awesome. Um, if you're using old versions of Angular, I would strongly urge you to update. Uh, last year, there was a lot of security research into the security of, of Angular and, and um, how people were using it. Um, if you're not familiar with Angular, basically you have these expression tags inside them, and you, you can put stuff in there that kind of looks like JavaScript, but it's not actually JavaScript. So in theory, it's safe, and developers think, oh, you know, it's safe, it's, it's okay, um, because it's not, it's not JavaScript. Um, well, in, in, uh, so in Angular 1.1.5, that second statement there will give you JavaScript execution. So if you were able to inject into an Angular expression, that would result in cross-site scripting. Um, and again, for a client-side app, that means complete control of the app. Uh, the interesting thing here is, you know, I was harping on earlier about, you know, don't use inner HTML, always use .text content, blah, 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 blah. If you've got an application which maybe you've got a bit of every, like you've got a bit of Angular and they may be doing some manual stuff, or maybe you have a few different libraries that do different things, if you were to set a, the context, the text content of a div, to an Angular expression, you could potentially end up with an issue, um, even though you're not using inner HTML. So this is this is where these um, frameworks are great for you know development and stuff like that, but they increase additional complexity, which makes it much harder to secure these um, applications. Um, I will note that that bug is well, it's not a bug, but that that's now that situation isn't the same anymore. In so the next version after 1.1.5, it's no longer it that doesn't cause scripting. And, and I do have to um, say the Angular team has done a pretty good job in trying to minimize the chance that this sort of thing can happen. Um, okay, so in general, frameworks, um, they're awesome and they're fantastic for functionality, but they add a lot of complexity to your application. So you need to make sure that you really understand the implications of what that, what that complexity does. Um, I was quite heartened actually to hear in uh, uh, the talk yesterday about web components and p people are thinking about uh, rating web components by their security. I thought that was really cool because I think that's the missing thing here is if you're using someone else's framework or someone else's component, you don't necessarily have the time or really want or the understanding to really, like you're trying to save time by using someone else's code. You don't want to have to think too much about it. So it's nice to um, you know, have some kind of security assurance around those sorts of things. Um, the other things about frameworks is they, they abstract away syncs, so they might hide things like in a HTML or things that they're doing that are potentially dangerous and you don't realize that. Um, they add syntactic sugar, so like in the, the knockout example, you, you might have a situation where we're very careful with all the attributes and maybe we have a blacklist that strips out attributes so that we know that um, we're not going to end up with scripting, but if we use a blacklist and a combination of a framework that adds in additional attributes that aren't in the HTML spec, it's going to be a bypass of our filter and we're going to end up with problems. Um, and, and finally, frameworks add loopholes to browser security controls. And I'm, I'll give you an example of, of that in a second. But the, fun, like the overarching thing here is this is really easy to get wrong. Um, and as a developer, you have, you, know, you have time schedules, you have all these other things you're thinking about, and security is one of a many, list of many things that you're thinking about. Um, so how, how can we make this situation better so that it's not, you know, if you make a mistake, it's not, not automatically a security issue? Um, and this is where content security policy comes in. Um, now, content security policy is, um, it was proposed in 2007 uh, at Mozilla. Uh, it's development for a number of years. The 1.0 spec went out last year, and now the 1.0 1, 1 spec support is in most browsers. Um, you can see the list there. IE has only a partial support at the moment, but um, as you can see, there's, there's fairly wide support for this. Um, part, of, part, part of the reason for this uh, is because it's very useful for protecting client side, it means it's actually very good for protecting browsers themselves. So you have a situation in Chrome where content security policy is actually used in the internals of Chrome to protect against script injection attacks and, and privilege escalation attacks. And that's something we're looking at in Firefox as well. Um, in, if you're a developer for Chrome extensions, you'll be familiar with CSP because there's automatically a CSP applied to Chrome extensions. And the same in Firefox OS apps, um, or at least the privileged ones anyway. If you want to if you want to write a, an app for Firefox OS that gets access to um, 
the more powerful permissions, we force a CSP upon you to, to protect the application and protect that permission. So what is CSP? Um, at its most basic level, CSP is a, a way of whitelisting where content comes from. Because if you've been paying attention to what I've been, or what I've been trying to say, or if it's my message has been coming across, it, it all can't, well, the basis of this is dangerous sources um, hitting, end up in bad places. So if we could somehow make a list of okay sources, we could completely remove the problems, or at least greatly reduce the problems. Um, that client security faces. Um, I'm not really going to go too deeply into con uh, content security policy. It's a little bit complicated, um, but uh, I would recommend the article here uh, by Mike West, who's one of the authors of the, the um, CSP standard. Um, he also, it's a good presentation that he's given, actually, as well, which is a great introduction to CSP. Um, but for now, I just want to sort of give you a, 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 just a quick example of, of how we use it, at least, in Firefox OS. So this is the actual CSP policy that we apply to privileged apps in Firefox OS. Um, and the main thing that you want to notice here is the script source self thing. Um, script, script source self means that uh, script sources can only be from the same origin that the application is hosted on. So if your application is hosted on www.foo.com, the scripts have to come from script files that are actually hosted on that um, uh, that, that domain. Um, in Firefox OS, it's actually uh, a situation where we give the apps their own synthetic origin, and it means we can be sure that the scripts are actually on the phone itself, and there's no way to include remote script. Um, so we know you're being safe. But uh, there's another implicit thing. So you'll see the last um, line here, so style source self, so it's quite similar, but then there's also unsafe inline. And that means you're allowed to do inline styles. Um, we don't allow inline scripts, but we do allow inline styles, to, mainly because a number of frameworks that people use commonly actually need that. So we weren't able to lock that down. But the, the main impact here is, is on scripts. Um, so what does it actually stop you from doing? So you can't do inline script tags in your HTML. You have to put your scripts in their own files. Uh, you can't do inline script in uh, inside attributes. So, for uh, example, up there, like you, you can't do URLs that contain uh, JavaScript URLs, but you also can't do things like on click equals and then a bunch of JavaScript. Um, you'll get a CSP error because of that. Um, and obviously, the, the implicit one there is you, you can't include third party scripts there. Um, a few other things, in, even in the scripts that you do include, uh, CSP will stop you from doing eval and stop you from, from doing function and turning strings into script. Um, so the, the, whole, the whole point of script source self is we know exactly where all the script is coming from. So that sounds pretty restrictive, and it is. I totally agree, but that's, like, that's the way of, of trying to make it secure, and so we can guarantee that the script that is inside an app on Firefox OS is the app that you installed on the phone, at least for this special type of apps anyway. Um, but what about frameworks with CSP? Do they, do they work with CSP? Well, unfortunately, not, not so much. Um, so handlebars relies on function.apply. Um, so unfortunately, that, uh, that, that, so you'll get a CSP error if you try and use that. Um, Knockout has a similar sort of problem. Um, but I did actually notice while I was researching this talk, someone came up against this. They'd written a Knockout app that they wanted to use as a Chrome extension. Um, and they, they ran into CSP issues. So what um, they actually wrote is a um, secure binding for Knockout that is CSP compliant. So it still works, but it will work with CSP. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And, and this is the sort of thing that I, I think that we need to start thinking about, is how do we, how do we meet in the middle between frameworks and, um, uh, and CSP? Um, Angular is, is probably the best in this regard. Angular actually has a CSP mode um, where you can, um, I, mean, I mean, there's obvious reasons for that because, you know, people want to be able to write Angular um, Chrome extensions and we, they, they force CSP. So um, that's basically how you set a CSP mode. Um, in earlier versions of Angular where you had a CSP mode, um, if you did something like the thing there, that would actually, because of the way Angular deconstructs and it basically, Angular's got a parser built into it, um, and it bypasses CSP 
to be able to allow you to do that. Um, now they fixed this bug now, but I, I thought it was very interesting that uh, so they basically made their framework compliant with CSP by introducing a complete uh, parsing language and a bypass of CSP. Um, but that's fixed now, uh, and you. Th there's the current state of, of, of some of the frameworks anyway that with CSP. So you, as you can see, at the moment, uh, CSP doesn't work very well with frameworks. But I, I think uh, if we're going to get to a state where we can be completely sure that client-side applications are actually secure, somehow we need to meet in the middle. Um, and there's, so there's, there is a lot of work going on with the... Um, uh, the CSP standard, things like uh, somehow being allow, able to provide a mechanism so that you can whitelist inline scripts and, and other things like that, which will, I think, make CSP a bit more user-friendly and a bit more compatible. Um, but I, I, I really think this is, uh, if we're going to get to a situation where, where client-side applications can be secure, we have to somehow find a way that we can be sure of security. Um, so, what, what are the summaries for my, for my talk here? Um, avoid using inner HTML. There's really no reason. Um, most of the time, like, you should be using text content pretty much all the time. And then occasionally, maybe you need to use inner HTML when, you, when you've got a, um, a string that may contain HTML. But if you get to that situation, you need to have a think about, OK, well, every time I'm about to use inner HTML, where's that input coming from? And I need to be very, very sure that that input's going to be safe. Um, and ideally, developers using whatever frameworks or whatever you know, um, structure that you're using in your workplaces, they, they should aim to be, be secure by default so that you don't have to think about it. Because if you have to think about it every time you want to insert something into the page, then that, you're going to get it wrong eventually. Um, you, I, to give you a concrete example of all of the security issues that we've had when developing Firefox OS in, in the front end layer, um, and, you know, I, my rough guess is there's probably been about 20, 19 of those were because of inner HTML. Um, so be very careful. Um, you need to understand your frameworks. Um, you need to understand uh, if they add syntactic sugar, uh, be aware of, of what the implications of that are. Um, and then compare that to what sanitizers you're using. If you have some kind of library that sanitizes text for you, does it take into account that you're using these kind of frameworks? And then you have to revisit that. Um, you also need to think about how do you update your frameworks when people find security vulnerabilities in frameworks. Um, but that's something you should probably already be thinking about. Um, and then finally, um, think about content security policy and uh, the protection that, that the content security policy brings. And I, I would encourage you to, to really try and understand that, and, it, and especially appealing to the people who uh, work on frameworks and, uh, and things like that. Consider making your framework um, CSP compliant, or maybe parts of your framework. Some some frameworks just can't be made CSP compliant because that's they, you want like the whole point of the framework is doing dynamic script, and that's very difficult. But I, I think the more that this that people push towards this direction, the, the safer the, the client side security will be. Um, and that's pretty much all I've got. So thank you very much. <laughs>